Holy God, we praise you and thank you, dear God, for the blessing of today. What a beautiful day, Father. We really appreciate these warm summer days and seeing the sunshine on the green creation, uh, knowing that you have brought rain uh, to satisfy the needs of this land, knowing, Father, that you have made everything beautiful in its time. We thank you for these physical blessings, and we thank you, dear God, for the opportunity to be here. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity to learn from those who've come before us, to see where they have faltered, to evaluate using your will uh, what has happened so that we can um, do differently and have different outcomes. Uh, we pray, Father, that you will please continue to be with us as we try to gain wisdom from the book of Judges. Bless our study, bless our time spent in this book, and help our time here to be uh, of eternal benefit. And uh, we offer this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So we are in the book of Judges, and we left off in the midst of chapter 4. Who is our, our judge of chapter 4? So heard softly said, Deborah, right. So Deborah is our judge of chapter 4. And what makes that interesting relative to what we know about what the Bible teaches about leadership and, and, and really the way things that in their ideal form work? Yeah, she's a, she's a woman. Yep. Yeah. Not some weird cultural thing where Deborah for a little while was a guy's name. Yeah, that's a woman. Yep. Yeah. So what else? What is that? What, what makes that interesting or noteworthy in light of the rest of the teaching of the Bible? Yeah, in terms of in terms of uh, God's spiritual arrangement, which is uh, was brought up last week, First Corinthians chapter eleven. Uh, now, this is obviously the Christian looking at this, and we know that maybe without Jesus being incarnate wouldn't be described the same way in the Old Testament. Nevertheless, it still expresses God's will, um, where Paul talks about the head of, of, of uh, Christ being God and the head of, of man being Christ and the head of woman being man, and sort of this, this way that leadership is supposed to function, not uh, relative to equality, as we talked about last time, but relative to role. Uh, God um, wants men to lead. One of the things that we note about the text that we've already seen is that the one man who God really has selected to lead has refused to do so. He has received a commandment that he has ignored. We don't know how long he had had that commandment, but we know that past tense he had that commandment and he had not responded to it. And so we don't want to act as though it's wrong uh, for women to step in these voids, but we do want to acknowledge that really um, men need to stand up. And the text is kind of pointing us to that idea. Um, and even in the solution that is brought out, um, a man still has to be involved. And um, when the man is involved, because he doesn't do so willingly, but, you know, by compulsion, um, he doesn't end up getting the glory, as we're going to find out in the story. So we, we reflected a lot uh, on this text, and we were thinking about roles. And, and I, I want us to really note this, because the book of Judges really calls for us to sort of dissect it, to think about, you know, what leads to this terrible outcome that we see in the, in the book's finale, or finale, 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 I don't know, the end of the book. Um, what do we, um, you know, what, what leads to this, this really disgusting, terrible situation that we see at the close of the book? It's, um, you know, really not unknowable. There, there is a series of things that happen or don't uh, that lead to what we see. And I would suggest that part of that is on display here in this chapter. We don't have a good man that God can pick at this time. And when God has to then move on from godly women, perhaps because there aren't even any of those anymore, he begins to, to pick less and less desirable men uh, for the responsibilities that, they, that, that he needs performed. I don't know. But, um, it's not... I think we we get so tied up about this because we think about it like, oh, isn't the woman good enough? But yeah, it's right. not about the woman stepping up and being a leader. It's about the fact that the man didn't. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah it's absolutely. Not that she's not capable. It's not that she's um, it's not that she's done the wrong thing for stepping up. But no, he should have stepped up first. Yeah, we we, we can't yeah. in any way shy away from the fact that God selected her. But where are the men here? And um, what well, we see, um, Balaam, we're going to see another man uh, later in the text um, who, uh, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll 
maybe wait to get to that. But, um, you know, the men are either cowardly or, or um, contra, contra God's purposes, as we're going to see in the text. Um, so let's talk about the deliverance that ends up um, actually occurring. How does this all play out? Remember, God said the victory is not going to be credited to a man. And uh, so there's going to be a rather, a rather unnoble way that all of this comes to an end for the uh, oppressing force, and particularly the, the captain of their host, Sisera. So um, when Barak uh, he musters the army, um, like we said, the men are either um, you know, slow to act or, as we find out, we have someone who is working against them. Um, so let's read about that in verses uh, 10 through 13. Zebulun and Naphtali to Kadesh, and ten thousand men went up, and his heels and never went up with them. Now Heber the Kenite had separated from the Kenites the descendants of Bob, the father in law of Moses, that pitched his tent as far away as the Oak of Zeanonim, which is near Kadesh. But Sisera was told that Barak, the son of Abinoam, had gone up to Mount Tabor. Sisera called out all his chariots, nine hundred chariots of iron, and all the men who were with them from Parisha. So there, there's always there's always things that happen whenever people um, kind of move away from where they ought to be. Um, you know, here you see the story of, of Heber the Kenite in chapter uh, 4, verse 11 here. And it, it says here that he separate himself from the Kenites, from the rest of this um, family that had kind of co-opted into um, the Israelite uh, nation. And uh, he pitched his tent, uh, it says, um, in the ter- near the Terameth tree at uh, Zahanim, uh, Zahanayim, uh, which is near uh, Kadesh. Now, if you're not familiar with those places, we're dealing with the, really the very southern extents of, of the, the territory. So he's moving out. And so sometimes when we move out, um, we find ourselves, you know, kind of more apt to side, unfortunately, with the enemy than we are with God's people. And so he reports it says here in uh, verse 12, um, uh, he and his family evidently uh, to Sisera uh, what uh, Barak is doing. And so Sisera is able to gather his troops and uh, to, to move and attack, perhaps maybe even before Barak was ready for that to happen. Um, so again, where are the men? Um, well, we find that Barak was the right guy to have initially received the commandment for the Lord uh, from the Lord, because what was he able to do? Yeah, he was able to get 10,000 guys together. Uh, and that, that's a pause point. Um, what, what is potential? You know, we, we, we sometimes think for whatever reason, and it's hard to say what all is going through Barak's heart and mind when he receives that commandment from the Lord initially. It's hard to say what was holding him up, what was keeping him from moving forward. But clearly there was a lot of potential there. Clearly he had leadership, leadership capabilities. So the question is, um, you know, well, maybe what's holding me up and what could happen if I yielded? What could happen if I just did what God wanted me to do? And uh, um, you can see here that God, again, you know, picked the right man and was able to prod him uh, through the selection of, of Deborah. Um, but uh, still, what more could have been had it played out differently? But again, where are the men? Uh, we have that story of him, and then we have also, again, the story of um, the, the, the man that we have described here, Heber, and um, moving away from God's people and already um, willing to, to sell them into the hand of, uh, of the enemy. Um, so uh, note that as you move forward, it's always true that bad stuff happens whenever God's people kind of get out there in the territory or they, um, you know, they, they kind of leave. Um, you only have to look um, to one of those stories that happens inside of the book of Ruth. There's, there's uh, uh, sometimes people overlook the great irony that, that opens up, that book opens up with, because there, there's a famine, right, in Judah. And then there's this family from Bethlehem that goes where in search of what? They go to Moab in search of food. Why is that ironic? Does anybody know what Bethlehem means? The house of bread. They left the house of bread in search of bread. And then what happens in in that search? Well, obviously God um, brings a great woman into their lives, but 
um, you find that those two those two boys and the husband die, and you find uh, a really a really jaded, unfaithful person in Naomi. Like we read that read that text and actually think about the way that she behaves. Um, really, uh, Ruth is a testament to to uh, a really good, truth seeking, open hearted person. Naomi's not very very helpful in that quest. God's providence is, but not Naomi. And so again, uh, what happens? You know, God can always bring something out of the ashes of, of um, you know, poor choices, but at the same time, what could have been otherwise with that family? What could have been with Heber? What could have been with Barak? Well, let's um, um, move forward and notice how God actually uses this, um, all this movement, this troop movement uh, to bring. So Barak went up, went down from Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. And the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and all his army with the edge of the sword before Barak. And Sisera alighted from his chariot and fled away on foot. But Barak pursued the chariots and the army as far as Parasheth, Nagoyim, and all the army of Sisera fell by the edge of the sword, not even one was left. Yeah, so the, the traitor didn't uh, perhaps achieve the desired end. The movement of Sisera's uh, army in haste uh, put them at a disadvantage once uh, Deborah was able to, to point out now is the time to attack. And so, of course, uh, Barak does that, and uh, the enemy is, is routed and defeated. Um, so what happens while they're running away? Um, well, what happens to Sisera in particular? Let's read uh, verses 17 through 22. But Sisera fled away on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite, for there was peace between Jabin, the king of Hazor, and the house of Heber the Kenite. And Jael came out to meet Sisera and said to him, Turn aside, my lord, turn aside to me, do not be afraid. So he turned it aside to her and into the tent, and she covered him with a rug. And he said to her, Please give me a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. So she opened a skin of milk, and gave him a drink and covered him. And he said to her, Stand at the opening of the tent. If any man comes out and asks, or comes and asks you, Is anyone here? Say no. But Jael, the wife of Heber, took a tent peg and took a hammer in her hand. Then she went softly to him and drove the peg into his temple until it was went down to the ground. While he was still lying fast asleep from weariness. So he died. The moment Barak was pursuing Sisera, Jael went out to meet him and said to him, Come, and I will show you the man whom you are seeking. So he went into her tent, and there lay Sisera dead, with a tent peg in his temple. Wow, I guess he got the point. <laughs> but, uh, sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I was wondering what I was going to do, and it only occurred to me at the very end. I know you thought that I had that prepared, but actually, there we go. Um, so anyway, you're, uh, um, you're reading here, and, and, and we saw Heber uh, betraying the movement of the Israelite troops to the enemy. We see, again, that uh, reference to the, the peace between him and uh, uh, Jabin, one of the kings of, um, um, in fact, the king of the oppression, the king of Canaan. Um, but clearly, um, you know, where are the men? Not where they should be. Where are the women? Uh, Deborah is faithful, and clearly Jael, at the very least, knows that this is not good what her husband has done. And uh, so even though there's peace between her husband and family uh, between them and this enemy, um, she uh, takes matters into her own, own hands quite literally. And uh, so, again, invites them in, and uh, you can probably don't need me to explain the rest. Uh, but, uh, um, you know, again, um, unconventional victory. God is working. He's, he's finding a way to bring about his, his, his will. But it doesn't make you feel great, the whole thing. It's just um, you're reading chapter um, three, and uh, we, we had that, 
you know, kind of normal summation kind of battle with Othniel. We find the Ehud, the assassin, and now we've got a lady with a tent peg in her hand. And it's just like, you know, what's going on here? Things are, things are definitely digressing. But again, um, poor decisions, God is still at work. Um, without Sisera, um, as uh, the uh, kind of the spear of his, of his, uh, of his army, uh, Jabin is uh, forced uh, uh, to, uh, to take a step back. He's weakened, and we find the children of Israel are able, to, are able to prevail. So let's read the last couple of verses there. So on that day, God subdued Jabin, king of Canaan, in the presence of the children of Israel, and the hand of the children of Israel grew stronger and stronger against Jabin, king of Canaan, until they had destroyed Jabin, king of Canaan. All right. So what, what uh, thoughts, questions, comments on chapter 4 before we, uh, we, we kind of um, move on to chapter 5 and think about this victory? Nothing? All right. I guess we did a comprehensive job last week and and uh and uh and today so um contrast this victory with joseph chapter three we already did i got ahead of myself so um but again like i said it's very very different so let's talk about uh chapter five chapter five is unique um we find really um uh, the kind of the last uh faithful hurrah you could call it because uh, when, when god's people um experience victory they sing and uh, you, you can see that um, as far back as uh, Exodus 14, right? The, uh, the song of the sea there, uh, that, that's kind of the way that it goes. But there aren't any songs of victory after this in this text. Um, so where do they go? Well, maybe there wasn't such an emphasis on the, the God who brought these victories. There wasn't such a seizing of the moment uh, to use it to teach. Because really what happens so often through the book of Judges is, yes, they cry out to the Lord, but the victory that they experience is never instructive, nor is the, the thing that they were crying out to the Lord because of, because they wind right back up and wind back up right in the same position again. They do the same things and they have the same outcomes, or even worse, as we said, as the book goes on. So there's a, there's a lesson here before we even get into the lesson of chapter five that, you know, really we ought to be more aware of God's operation in our lives, be more aware of what God has done. And, and celebrate that and talk about it more often, because uh, really um, that's the that's the example that we see of when things are going well. And so when we see this faithful judge in Deborah and uh, Abel to, to muster Barak along, it says Deborah and Barak in chapter five and verse one. Uh, but Barak is is kind of there, kind of kind of singing the backup clearly to these words. They're they're written more from Deborah's perspective than they are from Barak's, uh, but still. She's brought him along, and now the faithful are doing what they ought to do, noting the victory and noting where it's came, where it's come from. All right, so uh, the Song of Deborah and Barak, chapter five, verse one. Um, we we find that um, they they uh, praise God uh, for his his victory. Um, so verse, I'm just going to walk through the text here because I'll point out some things as we move as we move through it. Um, so chapter five, verse one. Then Deborah and Barak, the son of Ab uh, Abinoam, uh, sang on that day, saying. When leaders lead in Israel, when the people willingly offer themselves, bless the Lord. So when is the greatest opportunity, uh, according to that verse, when is the greatest opportunity for the Lord? Now, what, first of all, step aside for a second. What does it mean to bless the Lord? I thought the Lord was supposed to bless us. You find that a lot in the Old Testament. Bless the Lord. What does that mean? Praise the Lord. Well, that's not what it says, though. It says, "Bless the Lord." <laughs> I know, I know what you mean, but but let's connect the two somehow. Give him benefits. Yeah. Fulfill his will. Yeah. So fulfill his will. Uh, what does the word "bless" mean, though? Chantel uh, said something to to give him benefit. That that's what the word "bless" means. So, in what way uh, do we bless the Lord? And and we've we've said it, but I want, I want to spell it out a little bit more clearly. So when we do His will, we are um, giving Him glory by the fact that we're we're lifting up His name and uh, magnifying Him. Yeah, and who He is. Yeah. The the uh, the effort of the worshiper is to, in some way, do for God what God has done for us. You know, we 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 live our lives trying to do for God 
um, as God has done for us. You know, Paul talked about this in Colossians chapter one. He talked about filling it up the afflictions in his body um, of uh, of Christ. You know, he wanted to. He he knew that Jesus had done some things for him, and he wanted to do some things for Jesus. Now, God doesn't need our blessings. I mean, he doesn't he doesn't need us to do what we do for him, and yet that's our desire. It's kind of like you know. Um, it's kind of like your kids giving you presents. You know, there's not a time when your kids give you something when they're growing up and you're like, oh, I really, especially when they're young, I really needed that. You know, I was really looking for that. I, I thank you for delivering me out of this problem. You know, that's not really what the gift means. It's, it's more that you can see love on display and what they're trying to do. And that's what makes it significant. And so again, um, we, we, we come as, uh, to God our Father as children and give him um, gifts as children do and, and try our best to show him love. Now what, according to this verse, what is it that blesses the Lord? What, is it, what are the circumstances under which the Lord is blessed? The people volunteered. Mm. When the people willingly offer themselves, when they volunteered themselves, and when? When the leaders lead. Wow, that, that would have stung a little bit, Barak. You know, like, like uh, you wonder how, how heartily he was singing that line. You know? But, but like, like I said, it's, 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 um, it's a lesson here. This is what God wants. wants the leaders to lead, and he wants the people to offer themselves. That's the way that it should be. And under those circumstances, are we putting ourselves in the best position to render some kind of benefit to our God? When the leaders don't lead, when the people don't offer themselves, uh, God is not profited. God is not blessed, and we're not uh, faithful children uh, to him. So in verse 3, Hear, O kings, give ear, O princes. I, even I, will sing to the Lord. I will sing praise to the Lord God of Israel. Like I said, Barak is singing, but clearly this is from a perspective, and you're going to see it's not Barak's. In uh, verse 4, Lord, when you went out from Seir, when you marched from the field of Edom, the, Lord, the earth trembled and the heavens poured, the clouds also poured water. Um, what does that latter part kind of sound like? Storm. Bad traction for the chariot wheels. <laughs> Bad traction for the chariot. Maybe, maybe that was. Maybe it's actually pointing to the to the um, kind of the mo of their ability to route them. We don't know. I, I don't know that I can know that. But I was thinking more of that. I, I can't ask Brody about the song he likes to sing. I don't see him here tonight. But um, what you know, what's that song that he likes to sing? The voice. Voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of uh, all, all glory thunders. You know, kind of the the the, the coming of a storm. And, um, you know, really how that symbolizes the power of God. Why is God marching from Edom? Where is Edom relative to the, um, to the Israelites? Southeast. Yeah, south, kind of east, right? Um, you know, and this victory is, in the, is, is taking place in the southern part because we're, if we're dealing with a family, the Heber, right, who's down in Kadesh Barnea, we're dealing with the very southern part of the biblical territory, we're dealing with Judah. It's interesting that the people who come to fight are from Zebulun and Naphtali, um, you know, and, uh, you know, like, so something, something's, something's wrong here with this picture, but, uh, but if you're in Kadesh Barnea, where this victory is kind of realized and sisters defeated, and you go kind of almost due east across the Dead Sea there, you're going to come to you're going to come to Seir. You're going to come to the, the, the territory of, uh, of the Edomites. And uh, so what do we know from our study of Ezekiel of uh, the East? And what, what is that kind of reference in uh, prophecy and, and poetry? <coughs> the sun comes up in the East, right? And so God, the bringer of light, comes from the East, you know. And uh, we saw that when, um, you know, the temple... In that in that prophetic picture at the close of the book of Ezekiel was there. Um, where was that door that was kind of reserved? It's that eastern eastern door, right? And so anyway, um, the uh, there, there's also another possibility here. Um, compare this uh, to uh, I've got the scripture reference up there, Deuteronomy chapter 33 and verse two. Can someone read that for us? One of the teaching moments of, of Moses here. I don't know if this is a, uh, another look at it or if this is more of just saying this is a common image, but 
Um, he said, And the Lord came from Sinai and dawned on them from Seir. He shone forth from Mount Harad. He came from the midst of 10,000 holy ones. At his right hand, there was flashing lightning for them. Yeah. So, so again, coming from that same place, um, sometimes uh, some people think that it, maybe this is talking about, um, you know, like um, just coming from the east and God, the bringer of light, or maybe it's talking about uh, some sp specific victory. And uh, again, if we if we understand our God properly, we don't see us ourselves as being subjected to a series of defeats. That's going to be important when we get to the next guy. Um, so Gideon, Gideon, um, when the Lord calls him, his initial response to that call is, why aren't you doing what you used to do? Because his view of history has been, has been kind of turned on its head. He sees God's people as moving from defeat to defeat, when really the story should be, and, and always is, is with God, a story of victory to victory. We only experience defeat when we're on the wrong side. Yeah. It almost sounds like there was a huge thunderstorm. This is uh, like the earthquake. Like you yeah, know, yeah. Just massive thunderstorms coming down yeah. and taking away the advantage of the chariots where they were bogged down in the, in the muck. Yeah. If, if, um, if there were some, I, I think that's a strong possibility. Um, if there were some kind of note in the historical part of the text that, that kind of said that for sure, I would say, yeah, that's definitely what happened. But yeah, maybe. And uh, that certainly would explain why those chariots weren't so effective, right? So in any event, um, the uh, uh, mountains gush before the Lord, uh, this Sinai before uh, the Lord God of Israel. And so God brought deliverance. And is that poetry? Is that reality? Is it a combination of both? Well, still, again, God came and there was victory. So that's God and his victory. The conditions, um, you know, in part are when people actually finally responded, verse number two, uh, to his call. So let's talk about what happened. Sometimes in, in, um, in praise, poetry, you kind of get the end before the beginning. They tell you what happened, and then they go walk through the, the events, and again, do, doing so poetically. So let's talk about the battle. Let's talk about what happened. Um, in verses six through eight, we get the conditions for the battle. Um, so in verse six, in the days of Shamgar, the son of Anath, in the days of Jael, notice again the people who are highlighted here and who isn't. Um, you know, we see Shamgar and his notable work at the close of chapter 3, but we don't see uh, Barak being mentioned, Jael getting the praise, Barak not mentioned, as we said. Uh, he wasn't going to be back in chapter 4. The highways were deserted, and the travelers walked along the byways. What does that point to? Why aren't people taking the main roads? Yeah, the, the, the main roads are probably occupied by the enemy. And so they're having to take the, the, the back roads to try to avoid the enemy. Um, God's people are reduced to cowering. And in fact, to the extent that in verse number seven, village life ceased. It ceased in Israel. People weren't able to live as normal until I, Deborah, arose a, a mother in Israel. And they chose new gods. Then there was war in the gates. So we have, um, you know, what the situation and we have the cause. They chose new gods and there was war in the gates. And there wasn't an ability to respond to this. You know, we talked about Shamgar using what he had, but we talk about him using what he had uh, probably uh, not just, you know, because he had it with him, but because there wasn't another option. Uh, not a shield or a spear was seen among 40,000 in Israel. Um, First Samuel 3 talks about a similar situation during the, uh, the time of Eli and Samuel. Um, how the Philistines kind of had the control of who uh, of weapon making, and there weren't a lot of smiths in the um, in the uh, Israel amongst the Israelites. So maybe something like that's at play here. They don't have they don't have any they don't have any um, any uh, anybody to make weapons. They don't have any weapons. So uh, really, an ill-equipped army, no ability to respond. But um, what is needed? Do we need weapons? When is God blessed? What have we already seen? We use what we have. When God is blessed when the people willingly offer themselves and the leaders lead, we don't need to worry about weapons. We don't need to worry about uh, how we're going to arm ourselves for this fight or how we're going to win it. Uh, because it's not for us to determine all of that. It's only for us to yield ourselves. 
And so notice the call to action um, as, as uh, kind of we're walking through in poetry what happened. In verse number nine, my heart is with the rulers of Israel who offered themselves willingly with the people, bless the Lord. Um, so again, um, the, the situation brought up how the, um, the leaders offer themselves, the people offer themselves. Uh, and, um, and in such situations, God was able to be praised. So speak, he, she says, um, and they sing in verse 10, speak you who ride on white donkeys, who sit in judges attire and who walk along the road. Why does Deborah want them to speak, and who are they? White donkeys. How often are donkeys white? The rich people. Yeah, these are these are rich people because yeah, I mean, um, when you're when you're um, uh, when you just need a donkey to ride, you're not worried about what color it is, right? Um, it's kind of like um, the difference between the person who finds the car that's available versus the one who goes in the dealership and says, "I'd like that color." You know, that speaks to a different you know place economically, right? And so the, the people in these days uh, that rode white donkeys and who sit in judges attire are obviously the wealthy. Why does Deborah want them to speak? Because maybe they weren't, right? <laughs> yeah, they, they, they weren't. They need to speak. Because again, the leaders aren't leading. And so again, there's this call to action. Why aren't the wealthy doing what they can, using their wealth uh, as, a, as a way of helping to deliver their people? It's not as though the enemy has totally wiped out the ability to respond here. It's just that people aren't responding, right? And, and so uh, in verse 11, far from the noise of the archers among the, the watering places, there they shall recount the righteous acts of the Lord, the righteous acts uh, for his villagers in Israel. Then the people of the Lord shall go down uh, to the gates. And so um, if, we, if we got people talking and if we spread the news out, uh, then maybe we would have people responding as they ought to. And so this is why, uh, again, um, and it concludes this little, this little section here in uh, verses uh, 12 and 13. Awake, awake, Deborah, awake, awake, sing a song. Arise, Barak, and lead your captives away, O son of Abinoam. Uh, then the survivors came down, the people against the nobles. The Lord came down for me against the mighty. We couldn't get the rich to talk enough. Now they need to talk because we have responded. There has been a victory, and um, uh, people need to know about this so that we don't wind up here again. The Lord uh, came down through uh, not the rich, unfortunately, but through whom? In verse 12 the captives, the people who were kind of um, really uh, being oppressed in this situation. It, it's, it's sad that, um, you know, people don't keenly feel spiritual needs when their physical ones are being met, you know, really well. And that's always been true. So it really is a watchword to us. If things are going well in life, um, maybe we ask uh, Jake's question, how am I putting the kingdom first? I, I, like, I like that way of thinking about it, by the way. And um, I know you don't need me to say this, but um, you know, just to echo what he said, um, I really like when we, instead of um, asking the easy question, am I, we really try to quantify that and say, how am I? Because we can, we can be very dismissive of ourselves sometimes, give ourselves that pass mark really quickly, you know, and just, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm doing what I need to be doing. But really, am I? And again, am I volunteering and are, am I in my position of leadership leading? Am I using my benefit to benefit others? Um, God is going to, to work it out somehow. Uh, the captives respond, those who were oppressed respond, but really it would have been better for it to be the other way around. Um, so what is the response? In verse 14, from Ephraim were those whose roots were in Amalek. People struggle with that little phrase there, but most likely what that says is we've got Ephraimites and who are they living? Who have they set down roots amongst? The Amalekites. And um, is that the way it should be? No. So already we're getting a picture of the way that Israel is structured at this time and who they're living amongst and who really ought not be there. Um, after you, Benjamin, with your peoples uh, from Machir, uh, rulers came down and from Zebulun, those who bear the recruiter's staff. So we've got people who are working and, and gathering and responding. Uh, the princes of Issachar were with Deborah, as Issachar, was, uh, so was Barak. All right, he, he came along, <laughs> sent into the valley under his command. Among the divisions of Reuben, though, uh, there were great resolves of heart. Hmm. So there's people who are responding, and there's people who are doing what? 
who are thinking about it. Let me, let me think about this a little bit longer, the Reubenites said. Let me, let me sit down and let me, let me see what's going on here. Do I, do I really want to get myself involved in this? You know, like we've said, this is in the southern part of Israel. And where is Reuben's territory? The other side of the Jordan, way up there. Do I want to get involved in this? this is, you know, sometimes we have that, um, you know, that kind of not my problem syndrome. If it's not affecting me and my family, what do I care? So uh, the, the Reubenites are, are not, um, you know, they're thinking about it, but there's a, lot of, there's a lot of good intention that never yields any fruit. All right. The, um, you, you've heard the saying before, and I think it's worth uh, repeating, that, uh, that the road to hell is paved with what? Good intentions, right? So they're thinking about it, but Deborah asked the question, why did you sit among the sheepfolds? To hear the pipings for the flocks? What were you waiting for? I know uh, you had things to take care of. You had animals to, to, to care for. Uh, but really, is this what you should have done? The divisions of Reuben have great searchings of heart. But is that the way it should be? Further in uh, verse 17, Gilead stayed beyond the Jordan. And why did Dan remain on ships? Asher continued at the seashore and stayed by his inlets. Imagine if we started writing songs to chronicle events in the life of the congregation, and we talked about who attended and who didn't. <laughs> Would that be motivating? <laughs> you know, like uh, I, I, uh, I really love the directness that you see in biblical times. Like, and they're singing this song, and they're 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 calling out the people who were not involved and who were not uh, working. Uh, these guys were thinking about it. These guys didn't do anything. But then, in contrast to them. You see in verse 18, Zebulun is a people who jeopardized their lives to the point of death, Naphtali also on the heights of the battlefield. So these are the people who volunteered themselves. These are the people who came forward. And history will sing the praises of people who acted, not the people who didn't. Not the people who thought, not the people who sat, but the people who acted. And that's true in terms of human history, but it's all the more true in terms of the story of the church going forward. So uh, that was the response. Now we get to the battle. All right, we're moving forward kind of chronologically again through poetry. Verse 19, the kings came and fought. Then the kings of Canaan fought. And Ta'anak by the waters of Megiddo. A lot of stuff happens in Megiddo. Uh, they took no spoils of silver. They fought uh, from the heavens. The stars from their courses fought against uh, Sisera. So it wasn't a day where the enemies could, um, where the enemies could just, waltz over them and do what they had been doing. I think that's probably the meaning of the last line of verse 19, took no spoils of silver. Um, you know, there, there's, this isn't a day for them to have victory um, because um, there is a fighting from above. Um, what do we, we talked about this with, with, with um, prophet, prophecy and so it is in poetry. Um, what it, when, when you see stuff happening, stars and, you know, heavenly bodies, and all that kind of stuff, what's that all about? Powers are being shaken. Judgment is being rendered, right? So judgment is being rendered on this oppressive force. Um, so the torrent of Kishon uh, swept them away, a picture of you know, one of those dry riverbeds filling up and how quickly those flash floods roll through is a picture of how the enemy was defeated. Um, that, that ancient torrent, uh, the torrent of Kishon, oh, my soul, march on in strength. To pause and reflect upon that picture. Oh, I wish I could manifest that picture in my faith with my God. Then the horse's hooves pounded the galloping, galloping of his steeds. And uh, so, um, you know, we don't know that, I, I don't know that the Israelites were, were, were equipped as with horses, but, um, you know, still, uh, maybe this is like we said, that chaos that perhaps maybe is because of a storm. And, um, you know, but anyway, it's a picture of the, uh, of, of the victory being, being won. Curse Miraz said the angel of the Lord cursed its inhabitants bitterly because they did not come to the help of the Lord, to the help of the Lord against the mighty. Who else is noticing who volunteers themselves and who doesn't? God and the angels. The angels, what is their work relative to us? They, they are our ministers. Um, they are our servants. And you, you, we think about what it is for them to have that role. What do they leave and where do they come every time they do what they do. Where are the angels? 
They're in God's presence. They come where? Here, you know, to, to help us. Now, um, you know, I know the Lord, the Lord is omnipresent, but there's some sense of separation somehow uh, at the same time. When we, we study the Bible, God is there and we are here. So um, you can you can think about the angels as they you know we know First uh, Peter chapter one um, they're not they're not omniscient they're they're looking into things like what's going on what's what, what are you going to do next God and all this kind of stuff is happening and um, you know you ever think an angel ha is tempted with the thought what am I even coming down here for because they're leaving the presence of the eternal God to come and help us and sometimes we're really making it hard for them to want to do that <laughs> I'm sure. You know, um, because we're not volunteering ourselves. I mean, we we won't we won't abandon um, earthly pleasures sometimes to serve our, our God, and they're abandoning the presence of God to come down here and help us. That that really is powerful when you think about that, and you actually you know visualize this picture that you're getting in the in the poem here of the angels looking and saying, "What are these guys doing? Why aren't they doing something?" And they don't they don't mince words, do they? What do they wish upon the people who don't respond? It says curse. They wish a curse upon them, uh, which are strong words, biblically speaking. All right. So that's the battle. Uh, the enemy is defeated. Um, here, uh, this, this, song, this song takes a pretty dark turn here. Um, obviously, we, we already see that they, they uh, do things a little bit differently in the way that we do them. But um, we, we have Sisera's death recorded in verses 24 through 27. Most blessed among women is Jael. Again, the praise doesn't go to Barak. He's, he's there. He's mentioned but in passing. Uh, the praise goes to Jael. Uh, the wife of Heber the Kenite, blessed is she among women in tents. He asked for water, she gave milk, she brought out cream in a lordly bowl. She stretched her hand to the tent peg, her right hand to the workman's hammer. She pounded Sisera, pierced his head, split and struck through his temple. <laughs> we, we really sing different songs, don't we? I've never, I've never in my life sang a song like that. Um, you know, we, we, uh, the best we've got is maybe like Rescue Me from the Wicked that Jer Jeremiah sings sometimes. And it's like, well, what, like in what way are we going to rescue them? The tent peg to the head? <laughs> Just thinking about it here. Um, but anyway, uh, at her feet he sank, he fell, he lay still. At her feet he sank, he fell. Where he sank, there he fell, dead. And um, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> But, but like I said, it takes a really dark turn here at the end. We haven't finished yet. So, um, well, what's the effect? And, and um, this, is a, this is a clash of culture if ever there was one. Um, but again, why do things like this happen sometimes? To really drive home the fact that we've won, uh, to drive home the fact that uh, we need to focus on this, remember it, mark it, uh, because we are likely to forget it. And so they embellish the victory with this little thought about um, Sisera's mom. So Sisera's mom was over there, and um, what was she thinking? My little boy is going to come home. Now, does she think Sisera is a bad guy? Moms never think that their son is a bad guy. They always think their son is a good guy, right? So my son's going to come home, and what's he going to come home with? All the stuff that he got from those rotten Israelites. And so she's sitting there waiting. And what's going to happen? The mother of Sisera looked through the window and cried out through the lattice. Why is his chariot so long in coming? Why tarries the clatter of his chariots? We're, we're supposed to be hearing them come back now. Her wisest ladies answered her. Yes, she answered herself. Well, they're taking so long because they're getting more stuff. Are they not finding and dividing the spoil to every man a girl or two? For Sisera, plunder of dyed garments, plunder of garments embroidered and dyed, two pieces of dyed embroidery for the neck and, uh, uh, of the looter. They're going to get nice garments, nice girls. They're going to come back. Um, well, verse 31, thus let all your enemies perish, O Lord. But let those who love him be like the sun when it comes out in full strength. So when... Uh, when are uh, the, 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 the moms of the enemies going to be disappointed? But again, the people willingly offer themselves, the leaders lead, and uh, they do so in the way that we see, going back to verse 18, um, people jeopardizing their lives to the point of death. All right, any thoughts about the, uh, the Song of Deborah, chapter 5? You spent some time with that before? 
a lot of times that's one of those patches kind of people kind of pass over a little bit, but uh, it's pretty, pretty cool. Slow down. Think about uh, some of the, some of the words there. Um, thoughts, questions. Everybody awake, alive? All right. Maybe. No, but, but that's the thing that's puzzling about it. Barak singing. You know, it's kind of like, oh, all right. Yeah, all right. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how he's singing, but it says that it says the song of it says the, the Deborah and Barak um, sang chapter five, verse one. Yeah. So, hmm. yeah. I have no clue, but sometimes there's a relief that comes when you finally do what you have known that you were supposed to. Yeah. So it might not all be bitterness. Uh, yeah. Even on his part, there can be relief to finally doing what's you've known you should. Yeah. Yeah. And you think, um, you think, if only I had just done this sooner, you know. Um, and that, that really is so often the case whenever we um, are hesitant to do what, what God wants us to do. Um, afterwards, the experience almost always is, why didn't I do this sooner? And definitely one of relief. Other thoughts? All right. So may God's victories continue is how the, the text concludes. We read that verse. So let's go to chapter 6. All right. We had faithful guys. We had a faithful woman, maybe two. But we get to chapter 6, and what do we have? We have a guy who is hiding. Um, well, before we get um, to the guy who's hiding, let's read about the problem. And so we'll start off with the first six verses and read about the new problem, the Midianites. The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave into the hand of Midian seven years. And the hand of Midian overpowered Israel, and because Midian, the people of Israel, made for themselves the dens that are in the mountains and the caves and the strongholds. For whenever the Israelites planted crops, the Midianites and the Amalekites, the people of the east would come up against them. They would encamp against them and devour the produce of the land as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance in Israel and no sheep or ox or donkey. For they would come up with their livestock in their tents and they would come like locusts in number. Both they and their camels could not be counted. So they laid waste the land they came in. And Israel was brought very low because of Midian. And the people of Israel cried out for help to the Lord. I've got a vole problem, and um, the uh, voles, I, I planted some cabbage, and a couple of, and they don't even like the cabbage, but they think they're going to like the cabbage. And so they come out, and they, they take a leaf off it, and then you can see that they drag it a little way, and then they just leave it there. They're like, yeah, cabbage, yeah, and then they move on. And they've done that. They, they actually bit down two of those cabbages down to the, down to the very nub. They just, they just, they got, they got in there. There's nothing more frustrating than than planting something and having something come along and just take it. You know, I, I had to buy those. I, I, I'm, I'm lazy. I bought the seedlings. Sorry, uh, but I, I bought them. You know, and I wanted a cabbage, and um, you know, and and so you can imagine on a much much larger scale, the Israelites are planting their crops. And you have these these people. Midianites are um, they don't have like a nation, so to speak. They are nomadic, and um, that, that's um, you know they kind of go from place to place. But at periods they become um, instead of nomads that are shepherds like we see during the time of Moses, they become nomads that are bandits like we're seeing them here. And so we find the Midianites um, joined here. Um, what was the other enemy? Anyway, another one of the, one of those kind of nomadic groups. Amalekites, right? They come and they, they march down when the, during the time of harvest, all the expectation, all the hard work is about to be realized. They come in and they just take everything. And so that not only is demoralizing, but then what does that mean for the next year? I mean, it's essentially famine. It doesn't matter how good the growing season was. When the Amalekites come and the Midianites come and take everything, um, then it's all for naught. And uh, that means you're going to have a year that's miserable as you're deciding, do I eat this grain or do I save it for the next planting season? And if I save it for the next planting season, what's going to be the outcome? Is it going to be any different? So imagine the psychological you know, trauma that these people are going through. And how long did they go through this? Seven years, seven years. All right. So, um, the, uh, you know, so 
before we get to the, the solution, uh, there's a message that comes uh, from God. Let's read verses 7 through 10. The people of Israel cried out to the Lord on account of the Midianites. The Lord sent the prophets to the people of Israel and said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, who led you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of slavery. And I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of all who oppressed you, and I drove them out before you and gave you their land. And I said to you, I am the Lord your God. You shall not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. So the question um, I'm going to leave with you, and we will begin with next time, is why does that get brought up? Why does that get brought up? And you probably know a little bit of the answer, but we'll we'll flesh it out and talk about it, Lord willing, next time. Um, prior to that, though, any anything, any questions or comments from the first little bit of that chapter? All right. Well, let's uh, put our bookmarks in, and we'll uh, close out with a prayer. Holy God, we we praise you. As the God who comes and brings victory, a God of victories, we pray, Father, knowing that our defeats are ours and not yours, and that any time we find ourselves in a terrible position, a truly um, a difficult, sinful position, that it's not because of you, and that if ever we find ourselves in faithfulness, uh, taking a step back or finding ourselves, uh, you know, as Paul talked about, um, in need. If ever we find that, it's not because you've ceased to be God. It's because you have a purpose and you remain God and that the victory that will come uh, will we'll just continue that story of, of victories. Help us always to view you in that light so that we don't let our problems overcome us and so that we don't ever blame you uh, for when our sin catches up with us. Help us, Father, uh, to um, do as the text has called us to do this evening, to be a people who volunteer ourselves and to be a, a people among whom our leaders are leading. We pray, Father, thanking you for the ministering work of the angels, thanking you for all that is working in our favor. Help us to utilize this so that we can uh, more um, adequately attempt uh, to, to, to bless you. As you have blessed us, help us to bless you. We offer this in Jesus' name. Amen.